While I'm doing this video, the outside of Sweden is covered in snow and it's freezing. That's why I am sitting here with a hot cup of coffee in my hand and though the view from my window is stunningly white and fluffy, me and the cat are staying right inside. So the filming for this has been done months ago and I have had a bad conscience for not finishing it. But now here she is, the Sjöro, the sister of the two rå creatures that I have done episodes of earlier. Scandinavian folklore is full of these ruler beings, beings that rule their domain. The most known of these are Skogsrå, Gruvrå and the Sjöro. They have their cousin in the Tomte, the male spirit that was a protector and carer of the farm. And I will put a link to all the other episodes in the description down below. As I talked about in the episode about Skogsrå, the Sjöro is probably very old and might have roots in pre-Christian era. It is hard to be sure the older times the less material we usually have to work with. Some say she is a remnant from Ran, the old goddess of the sea. She does bear a lot of resemblance with the goddess Ran and her nine daughters. Ran was thought to drag down unlucky seafarers and fishermen into the sea with her net. And she could cause storm and calm storms and do all these things that can mean life or death out on the water. But it's also a fact that all around the world where there have been fishermen and seafarers, there have also been some kind of water creature that has more or less the exact power as Ran. There is also the fact that Sjöroet and Skogsroet, her land-living sister, is so much alike that sometimes it is hard to know which being the old stories actually are talking about. A whole lot of the tales about Skogsroet is told about Sjöroet in areas where there is more water than forest, and likewise. Sjöroet and Havsroet is not even the same being in some places. So, as usual with folklore beings, there is a lot of things that could be, could be not, and we are just not sure. We can only come up with different theories that is more or less, this is the most likely scenario. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why is that? Why can't we be sure? Well, as I mentioned before, we do not have that much of the really old sources about folklore. This is because before 17th century, folklore and what people really believed in except God was not that interesting. Well, the common people was, as a rule, not that interesting. Mostly it is short passages where the church complains about the common people doing stuff that the church deemed as idolatry, worshipping other gods than the one and only true God. We see this in the Holy Birgitta's text when she talks about Tomta Gudi, the Tomta God. And then, of course, we have court documents where people have been sentenced for collaboration with the supernatural, which, before the witch hysteria during 16th century, wasn't actually that common here up in Scandinavia. During the 16th century, there was suddenly a need to create the big and powerful history that bound Scandinavia together. Sweden and Denmark had not been the best neighbors to neither Finland nor Norway, and now the race of who will dominate Scandinavia and most of the Slavic coastline really amped up. That's when the scholars first started to actually write down what had been a long and old oral tradition. But they were more interested in connecting everything to the Vikings and creating that common great history than making a real effort at writing down things that academics today would actually like to know. Then came the natural romantic era during 19th century, my pet PV, where the scholars once again gathered a huge amount of material, but they were very colored by a love for our Viking heritage and a nationalistic idea about what was the true original Scandinavian story and the master race. Does it sound familiar? Yes, there was a lot of ideas back then that some guys that liked to dress in brown and black and wave flags picked up a couple of decades later. So, even though we should be very grateful for the enormous job that the 19th century scholars did, when they collected that vast library of folklore, folk tales and folk belief, even the younger sources needs to be handled with a little bit of care. From what we can see, 
from the sources we have though, it's that the pre-Christian era seems to be full of these kinds of beings, a sort of land spirit that rules over a certain domain. And the people need to please them with offerings and by following their rules and not anger them. This was not the ruling class of the people, the great warriors that the Icelandic tales tells so often about, the ones that led people to go raiding in England and France. No, this was the farmers and the common people, and for them, nature was scary. Today, it might be a cute thing to put out porridge for the tomte or throw a coin in the water as a gesture to the Sjöråa. But back in the older days, during both Iron Age and later medieval times, the nature was not something to toy with. Nature was the thing that either put food on your table or made you starve, or could cause your roof to cave in during a storm. It was a scary world, and the land spirits, the invisible beings that were said to live near, this was one thing that you could try and please so your life felt safer. The worshipping of all the land spirits seems to be so rooted in people's behavior that even 500 years later after they all got Christianized, people still talked about the invisible people, the land spirits and the rulers of nature. Nature was still scary and you still needed food on your table and a roof over your head. So what harm could it be to continue to keep the peace with your invisible neighbors, right? But despite the church and the priesthood trying very hard to make people stop putting out food and offerings for the spirits, the folklore of the land lived on very strong up here in the north. We have medieval ballads that mention the Sjöro, where she usually is luring some poor knight or prince down to live with her for all eternity under the surface of the water. Hafs Frun is told about in old medieval tale, Diedrich's Tale, that is written around the 15th century but is believed to be much older than that. She is also frequently mentioned in the old medieval ballads. The most famous, perhaps, is Herr Olof och Hafsfrun, that probably is strongly inspired by Diedrich's tale. So, with this in our minds, even if the name Sjöro and the finer detail of her might have changed, the basic idea of a creature living in the lake and the sea seems to be as old as there has been people. Who came first? Who influenced who? That is impossible to say. Maybe they actually have appeared independent from each other because the sea and the water does come with very similar dangers regardless of where you are in the world. Something that differs the Scandinavian Sjöro from the more common and perhaps modern version of a mermaid is that she usually comes with legs instead of a fishtail. There are stories of her with a fishtail but the most common version seem to be the same kind as about her sister Skogsroet. She looks as a beautiful normal woman from the front, but when she turns her back to you, she's rotten, hollow or have fish scales or other fish traits. She could also have green or bluish hair. She was hard to get a glimpse of, but when you did, you normally would see her sitting on the edge of a rock, combing her long hair, or just see a hand waving from the water. If you took your boat close to that hand and either put a warm mitten on it, or gave her some food or some drinks, she would help you in the future. There is a tale from an island in uh, the east of Sweden, next to the Baltic Sea, in something that called Mr. Hult's Archipelago. And this island was very well known for things like mirages and magic beings living there. Once a group of fishermen had put anchor next to the island and entered the shore to make a fire going and get some warmth and food. One of the fishermen walked away from the party and he found a mitten laying on the shore. He didn't touch the mitten, just put down another mitten that looked just like the one he found and then he went back to his friends. After he gone just a little bit he could hear a voice from the rock. Mitten friend, mitten friend, draw up your anchor and put it east under the island. The seafarer obeyed and the group moved the boat. Just a moment after they had done this, a big storm grew over the sea. 
And if they haven't moved the boat at all, well, most of them will probably be dead. This story is told in a lot of other versions around Sweden. Magnus Olaus in his script from the 16th century mentioned this story as ancient. So this seems to be a story that also have traveled very well. Just as her sister in the woods though, this woman also have her own cattle. But while her land living sister liked white cows, her cattle was striped or spotted. You could see them grazing next to the shore, and if they noticed you, they would run out in the water and disappear. Just as with other supernatural cattle, if you managed to throw some steel over the back of the cow, you could take that cow home with you, and it always milked much better than the other cows. This story is about the supernatural cows always says they milked better than the normal cows. And this proves how important milk has been for farmers up here in the north. Dairy products is still consumed in much larger quantities in Scandinavia compared to most other parts of the world. And this is probably because milk, cheese, butter and other dairy products was a good protein source for all social classes. When the cattle wasn't up on the shore grazing, they lived with her in form of fishes. So if you get a particular big pike on your hook, and it had some kind of strange marking on it, you better throw it back again, because there was a high risk that this pike was her leading cow. Killing that fish would have angered her gravely and could make you never have one fish in your net again. Or she could even kill you with a storm. There is a lot of stories about fishermen that anger her and then are never seen again because they didn't show her proper respect. There were many fishermen that had a habit of giving her a bit of tobacco, a bit of booze or a coin that they threw in the water. If you want to be sure to get good weather and fish in your net, it couldn't hurt to try and put a coin in the water or give the sjöro some tobacco. Because, you know, you never know. Thank you for listening. I do hope you enjoy this and that you press like in that case. Also, please share and comment to help spread this channel content, because who doesn't need a little bit of folklore in their life? If you want to support and help me to afford filming things like this, please consider becoming my patron or buy me a coffee on my Ko-fi page. You will find the links in the description below. Stay safe and healthy and I'll see you in my next video.